So I'm Charlotte. I'm an equality, diversity and inclusion consultant at the Equal Group. So we're a data driven EDI consultancy based in Birmingham. And we work alongside forward thinking businesses and organisations just to provide consulting and tech solutions um, to deliver sustainable progress. So our passion comes from a deep seated belief um, that EDI benefits not only individuals, but also organisations. So changing attitudes in the workplace, it's a catalyst for how we interact uh, with our own colleagues in and outside the office or other environments. And as most of you know, International Women's Day is celebrated around the world just to recognise women for their achievements. So let's just have a little think. When you imagine a construction site, uh, the transport industry, um, you know, or the energy sector, do you visualise a male or female dominated workforce? We all have biases when it comes to these sectors, in particular as a result of adverts, films, um, and just day-to-day -day encounters as well, just influencing the way that we view sectors. So changing our own biases is the first step to creating an inclusive environment where women can only can thrive and progress. So within the workforces, women hold 77% of jobs in the health and social work sector and 70% of jobs in education. If you think of that in respect of the proportion of jobs held by women in construction, that's 16% um, and transport and storage, 26%. So I think what I'd like to do now is just to introduce our lovely speakers um, and just get some background. So I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by three incredible guest speakers. So that's the Women in Construction Ambassador and BBC Apprentice finalist, Michaela Wayne. Um, also project engineer for Network Rail, Michelle Lim, um, and member of the GEMSERV executive team, Miriam Atkin. So I'll just go around the room if you can introduce yourselves. I'll come to you first, Michaela. Yes, thanks, Charlotte. Um, yep, I'm Michaela Wayne. I was on The Apprentice a few years ago, uh, like was shown on the fact that I was a woman in construction and I guess we're far and few between. And since then, I already had several businesses in the construction industry, but since then I've been ambassador for women in construction. We created the first Women in Construction Awards last year to try and create some visibility and tell the story of um, the brilliant work that women do in construction um, and make this a positive um, thing rather than pointing out all the problems, actually telling the positive stories of women in construction. Um, we're doing it again this year, so all good. I love women in construction. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Michaela. Uh, Michelle, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Michelle Lemsanian. I am I used to be on the Graduate Railway Engineering Scheme for Network Rail. I'm a tertiary civil engineer, and the reason why I'm in the railway industry is because I love connecting people, because everyone needs to get everywhere, and it's such a basic equal need, and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thanks, Michelle. And Miriam? Hi, I'm Miriam Atkin. I'm a director. I do, uh, run the Energy Business Unit at GEMSERV. Um, I've worked in the energy sector for the last five years, but the earlier part of my career, I worked in, um, had a background in finance uh, and commercial um, decision making and worked in a number of industries. Um, so happy to share my thoughts and uh, 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 assessment of both the energy sector and some of the other sectors that I've worked in, um, in my earlier career. Amazing. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited to speak to you all. Um, so I am just going to crack straight into the questions. So what I'm going to do is um, direct a question to one person, but then try and open up the floor a little bit um, to anyone else with any other comments. So initially, um, just want to know, you know, why do you think the difference between equity and equality are so important to recognise? And I'm going to come to Michaela first. Oh, green is straight. <laughs> I was hoping you go to Murphy or Marsha. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so I can only talk about construction. That's the industry I'm in. But the if we just talk about the very basic things. So there's only 25% of construction sites in the UK that actually have female toilets. And as we know, women have different needs to men uh, when it comes to sanitary work. So um 
what a good company would do is provide those facilities. <laughs> so this is different to being equal. We don't just need a toilet, which I mean, would be great at this point. Um, but if we can have additions within those toilets as well. So we just have our basic human rights kept intact whilst in the work environment. I guess that would be um, a basic thing, which is super important in this industry. Um, but also when we're looking at maternity leave, it's one of the biggest reasons that women actually leave construction and go into other industries. It's so fast paced that if you do take nine months or 18 months off, the chances are the project that you was working on is now gone. You've got to go into a new project, a new team. You're not really kept in the loop with this. There's no programs around this. And also maternity pay is really terrible in the industry. So I think just acknowledging, we have to acknowledge the differences, what women are going to go through in their lives, whether that's pregnancy, menopause, needing to go to the toilet, and the differences between men and women, and then help women out with that. And that's the difference between equity and equality that I find in construction. Yeah, and that's absolutely huge, isn't it? Celebrating the differences, as you say, I think that's a massive part of it. I'm going to come to Miriam next. Well, actually, I thought that was a really interesting um, examples given there, because it's similarly in the energy sector. Um, I was listening to um, a female engineer a few months back, about six months back, talking about working on in a wind farm and, um, you know, the problems with access to toilets, etc., cetera, for, for women in that environment as well. So that, that challenge is equally problematic in the energy sector. Um, but I also, and, and I, but I also think, um, you know, um, energy is quite a broad sector. There's what I call their sort of on the ground and, you know, spanners and screwdriver type roles, but there are lots and lots of roles that are um, office based or, or somewhat different to that. And I think it's also important that we um, recognise the chat. There are challenges there um, from, from an, a sort of an equity perspective. Um, and, and to take the maternity pay point, um, one of the big issues for me is um, fair and equal pay. Um, and I think, you know, we know the cost of childcare, for example, is, is horrendous and many people really struggle with that. And I think that's one of the challenges. If, if you're not even paid fairly and, and equally with your male counterparts, then that makes it potentially even harder to come back to work after a spell of maternity leave. So similar points, really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michelle, anything to add? Uh, they picked up all the good ones. <laughs> um, so I feel like the difference between equity and equality is that you need to distribute the resources for those who need it um, because different people need different things. And I've attended quite a lot of STEM events and I can see the differences between like different schools and academies. So putting in a framework to support these people as they're coming, oh, sorry, these people, the different types of people as they're coming up and encourage them like, oh, have you thought about a career in this industry? Have you thought about a career in another industry? And maybe not just for women, but maybe for people who are neurodiverse as well. And it's coming to the toilet one. Um, it's not just I've it's not just the toilet, but I've been on numerous site visits. Uh, I should have expanded on the project engineer, but I take care of the a portfolio of projects in the west coast of Scotland so I'm over the west coast of Scotland and I have been to numerous site visits and sometimes it's quite daunting and scary because I am on site on my own on night shifts and there's like some rustle in the bushes and I'm just like I hope that was just a fox and nothing else so difference between equity and equality maybe someone else who is a man might think it's okay but as a woman myself I would be a bit scared maybe that's not a fox maybe that's another human being or maybe that's something else that i would not be able to deal with so toilets yep safety structures in place and definitely supporting uh, people of different backgrounds yeah definitely and i think that's why representation is so important in order for us to get those perspectives that we need when it comes to equity um i feel like a lot has been answered in relation to the next question, but just in case there's any other points um, that you feel are important. I'm gonna come straight back to you, Michelle, um, but what does equity look like within your industry? Equity, oh, equity. There has been support networks put in place 
However, I feel like it scratches the surface only and it's not dealing with deeper rooted issues, which I'll talk about in the next question, which is the barriers. Um, there are support structures. So for example, um, one of uh, my colleagues, uh, she was on maternity leave, but this was before they had maternity leave. And then the uh, she was in trouble. I don't want to say too much because it's recorded. She was in trouble and she was at risk of being um, fired from her job because she was pregnant, she gave birth, and then she needed that maternity leave. So her trade union was able to fight for her rights and said that, well, actually, although she has been um, sick leave for maybe two months, there was another person who was on sick leave for three months. So why is it that this other person who's male can be on sick leave for three months, whereas this uh, person, this woman, could not be on sick leave for two months? And then because of that, then she got her, she could still keep her job and she still works in the railway and her child has grown up and also works in the railway. So having this distributed form of support in the like trade unions is absolutely spectacular. I know it's not the same for other people though. Yeah, and that is a difficult situation to navigate. So having that support is huge and having that understanding of the needs as well. Um, Michaela? Um, yeah, I mean, equity doesn't look like a lot, to be honest, in construction. It, it is a poor industry. I know you quoted the figures as 16%, but actually on the tools, it's less than 2%. Um, so it's really challenging to have your um, find solutions to the problems as just such a small minority. But in not acknowledging this, then we, we're failing to attract and retain. So we're just not growing at all on that side of things. I think um, recently there's been more about if you, I, I can only speak about women instruction, that's like my thing, what I do. But I do know when you look at things like mental health, neurodiversity, all of these other um guess underrepresented um, demographics there are pushes and people are talking about this but the conversations I've been having have been happening for 15 years like just me alone I know women who have been talking about being a woman instruction for 40 years and and nothing's nothing is changing you're speaking echo chambers other people who agree with you the people who don't agree don't want to say anything it can never never get changed I think where we really need to start um, is by acknowledging the differences, it's it's a key thing for me, you know, really understanding the figures you gave of women in healthcare and women in um, education, like brilliant. And that is, and to generalize, women in general are more empathetic, women are perhaps more caring and, and they're attracted to these caring roles and that is fine, but you can use empathy and this caring nature and bring it over into construction. So we have to acknowledge these differences, the positives that women might just have genetically and, and speak about this and create equity, show people the benefits, show people the positive sides and what women can actually do within the construction industry. And I think only at that point can we start saying, right, how can we make this more equitable for underrepresented uh, demographics? Sorry, that was really long. <laughs> No, it's all it's all really interesting points, though, and it, it again comes down to that perspective, isn't it? Like, what do we see? How do, how is our bias affecting um, the change? And also, the media has a lot to do with that, don't they? I know we've touched on um, adverts, films, like day to day interactions when it comes to these industries, but I think a lot of the time, you if you can't see it, you can't be it. And as limiting as that seems as a sentence, generally, it is one of those situations where, you know, the more you see it, like with the Lionesses when they won um, last year and they won the football, I think that was a huge piece for, you know, boys and girls everywhere um, to understand that, you know, they're represented and they can move forward and do something that potentially they may have thought they, they weren't able to do before. Um, Miriam? Yeah, well, I think um, you touched on there about role models, and I think that's so important in a number of different um, guises, if you like. Um, I keep a, a bit of an eye on the um, stats that come out annually about the leadership, you know, the FTSE 350 or whatever, and how many are women. And um, some stats were produced last week uh, for International Women, just before International Women's Day, saying I think it's something like 40% of FTSE 350 roles are now um, women um, but actually when you look at the the detail 
<laughs> a lot of those are non-executive director roles and they're not executive roles. So they're not CIO, CTO, CEO necessarily type roles. Um, and I really do believe that it starts any, in any organization, leadership is absolutely essential and it starts from the top. So we have to have role models in all of our sectors at the, at the top and, and throughout the different layers of management throughout our organizations. Um, you know, that for me is is really important. And there are a number of energy companies that have no women on their executive team. I mean, in this day and age, I find that utterly shocking that they're not ashamed of themselves those companies I really find it shocking um and actually one of the other things that I would say in on the same sort of vein is um gender pay uh, stats the vast majority of companies in this country are small and medium-sized enterprises yet they are not required to publish any metrics about gender pay it's only companies above 250 um so I actually really feel that that should become more widely. It's not a me it's not that difficult, um, and I think if we could see that data, that would be uh, and the, the, all the women and men who work for those organisations had access to that data. I mean, my company we've got about two hundred and fifteen employees, and we actually publish it voluntarily. Um, and I, I would love to see more of that as well. Yeah, definitely. And whilst it's not um, in legislation that they need to do that, again, it's one of those, it's the best practice, isn't it? Um, you want to be seen as a sector that's pushing for change and, and trying to make things, you know, change as they should. Mm. Um, but I think when it comes to data as well, it's important to make sure that it's it's actionable, that things are coming from that data as well. So it's, it's good to publish, amazing to publish it all, um, but we need to make sure we're attaching tangible actions to those as well. Um, so just moving on to the next question, which I think is going to be a biggie. Um, so it's what are the barriers faced by women mm. in these industries and how can we begin to remove those? And I'm just going to come to you, Miriam. Well, I've talked about role models already, so I won't repeat that. And I, I think, I mean, I've talked a little bit about leadership roles and so on, but I think um, um, just, you know, on television, the media, social media, seeing more women in those sectors in the roles that we've perhaps more traditionally thought of as male I agree is, is, is essential um, I also think and I noticed on the chat actually there's a point about I think flexibility is a really important point here as well um, what prevents women from going into these types of roles is, is well as flexibility so will they be able to um, do that role in conjunction with any other responsibilities they may have um, and I think importantly um, asking for flexibility or asking shouldn't be seen as a barrier so I think you know there can often be an assumption that if you want to work uh, flexibly let's say condense your hours to four days a week or work part-time or something like that but you're no longer interested in a career you know that, that that's nonsense clearly um so those sort of patriarchal views so i think um it's important that people feel and can have the confidence that they can ask uh, and have access to flexible ways of working so that um, and as i said i noticed on the chat somebody was saying that people often go from the more hands-on role when they come back after the turn to leave feel, tend to go into the more administrative roles which which implies there's there's a lack of um accommodation in those operational roles to enable them to do that so they're very important points for me yeah absolutely and all of those points also um, contribute to the gender pay gap and you know all of the concerns in that respect um, michelle Sorry there, I was actually taking notes because those were really good points. Um, so barriers, it's funny you say that because I think one of the most impactful barrier I've encountered was from another woman. And it was along the lines of, I've gone through difficult challenges, which has shaped me, and so should you. And this falls into the you know philosophy of etiology, cause and effect versus teleology, which is like phenomenon in terms of the purpose it serves rather than cause by which it arose. And what happened was this person was adopting the etiology. So they were surrendering their power by creating excuses and finding reasons for not moving forward or trying to change their environment. Um, whereas if people were to adopt a, a teleology, then it means that they're not a victim to their events. They'll be like, actually, I have suffered from this, but what can I do about this? 
because I've suffered, I will be more of an advocate. There's also another barrier which I've noticed, which is the toxic positivity. And it's not just to do with the company where they're saying, yeah, we're doing this, it's great, it's amazing, but rather it's better to practice self-acceptance. Huh? Okay, we have maybe X percentage of women. How can we do better rather than just celebrating every single teeny tiny thing? So you've had one woman in this whole organization and then you've had another woman. Congrats, you've doubled it by 100%, but realistically, it's still only one single digit. And with the self, I find that for me, when I've had to face these kind of barriers between everyone, it was difficult because it's easy to fall into the prey of, I can totally do X, Y, Z, and then overpromise. Um, then I'll talk about that later. But it's important to realize that, okay, I am only at 60%. So how can I reach 90%? What can I do that is objectively easy for me to accomplish? And then I'll build on these later on and then build up that confidence. Because as Charlotte was talking about with the media and how men are represented in a lot more um, forms of movies and TV shows, they have a lot more self-confidence. Whereas I find that when I'm talking to other women, they don't have as much self-confidence. They don't apply for things. And then as such, they're put on the, um, the then as such, they, they just don't get those higher roles. Like uh, Miriam was talking about the executive roles. So that's for myself. I think you touched on a really important point as well there in re in relation to confidence um, when it comes to progression as well. I think there's a statistic out there that men will go for a position even if they think they know 50% of the role or what they need to fulfill that role, whereas women are more likely to feel that they need at least 95% of the knowledge. And I know as a woman myself, that is something that personally <laughs> I've definitely um, contributed to that statistic. <laughs> But it's, that's why allyship, as um, Michelle mentioned as well, is so important when it comes to women supporting women as well. Um, I know that myself and Michaela actually touched on that last week um, when we had a little chat, um, but I'm going to come to you anyway now, Michaela. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, actually, we found last year, which I found really interesting, with our awards, there was um, eight different categories last year. And there was one of them that was a female business owner and 90% of those applicants um, were self-nominating. And across all of the other ones, it was more like 85% who had been nominated by other women. So I just found it really interesting that those women who have perhaps grown in confidence by owning their own companies and that, you know, have learned to ask for things because you have to ask for things, was confident enough to put themselves forward. But when it came to other sectors like women on the tools, women in leadership, industry pioneer, et cetera, it was other people who was putting them forward. And still now, like really strong women who I know in construction, who are judges on the panels, who are MDs of large organisations, will not put themselves forward. I'm like, you have to break the mould. You have to ask for this. Like, what is going on? We need to start displaying confidence. Like, what is wrong with saying, I'm so amazed and I deserve an award for it? I honestly think I deserve an award for having two children and running my businesses. If there was an award for that, I want it. I will self nominate. This is hard. Let's talk about it. Let's get used to picking ourselves up and, and pointing this out. And interestingly, on the pay, my partner has his own company. He actually uh, works in a kitchen. He has a healthy eating company and I work in construction, so raw of us all. And um, he said the only people who have asked him for a pay rise are men. And he's had women who's worked there now for five, six years. They've never asked him. He has to go to them and say, all right, come on, let's have a pay review. Yeah, we're going to get, they will, they've never asked, not one. And I think he employs maybe 30 odd people and it's never happened in all this time. And I'm like, this is a big message that we need to be um, giving to women. Like, absolutely say you deserve more. You have to understand your worth and, and put a monetary cost on that. I know that I am worth X amount an hour. If you want me to come and speak somewhere, if you want me to work for your business, if you want me to do anything, I am getting paid for that. And this is what I expect. And I'm not afraid to say that. I think we, as children, were taught women, you know, don't climb that tree, don't get into fights, don't do this, don't do that. And our confidence is never 
built from childhood whereas little boys that you know they they get rough and ready they get messed up but get back up you'll be all right and the confidence grows over time with the um I guess their exposure to risk and getting better from it and as women we're just brainwashed and don't have that same upbringing I think that's a real has a real impact on us then when we go into our careers thankfully I was brought up with four brothers and my mum was basically a nut job so I never I never had um I grew up with confidence um, and, and another couple of things that I want to just touch on one of the key barriers I think is the unconscious bias and these kind of hands off men in construction so I know we've touched on unconscious bias I think we all know what it is at this point like we presume that women can't lift bags or you know they can't carry their own toolbox on the site and um, because they might not have the same physical attributes as men um, but also the, the hands off men, these men are like, I fully, I fully back this. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll leave you to sort it out because I'm uncomfortable in this conversation and I want you to have your own space. And I, I, we want to be able to talk to you because you are the decision makers. The industry is still made up as 85 percent men. They're, they're predominantly giving the jobs out, giving the, the tenders out, awarding contracts. So we need men to be part of this conversation as well. And I think that's a real barrier to progression when we're so stern with we want this and we want that as, as some people can be, then you can you can turn off the men I guess the decision makers those allies who do want to help us but perhaps they don't really understand how so I'm about positivity including the men in the conversation it's so so important and not saying all of this is your fault partly some of it is our fault partly some of it is other people's fault let's have the conversation and progress Definitely. And then Miriam, did you have something you wanted yeah, to add? Yeah, I, I really did want to sort of expand on a couple of those points. I think on the pay point, it's not just when you're in an, in a role and asking for a pay rise. It's at the very beginning when you might have successfully been offered a job. And one of the um, things that we've adopted um, since I joined my company was not asking people what their current pay is, because women are often underpaid. And so trying to badge the job to what they would say, give them a little bit more than what they were previously paid is just reinforcing the fact that they're underpaid. And so to say, this job is worth X amount of money. And if that's a 20 grand pay rise, so be it, you know, it doesn't actually matter because that's what the job's worth. And if we think you're good enough to, so I think that's a really important thing. And the other point actually is also about the recruitment and um, trying to make sure that your job adverts and job descriptions are appealing so that they don't put women off. Um, I mean, there's been talk over this for a number of years, but, um, you know, in the energy sector, we find this a challenge, particularly looking for consultants, for example. Um, and so what we try to do is try, and try really hard to write them in a way that there's not a great big long list. And woman goes, no, no, yes, yes, no, 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 I can't apply. And to do it in a way that these things are you know, if you have these things, that'd be great, but you might have other skills that are also relevant and so on to try and encourage a, a, a sort of a breadth of um, applications. And then I completely agree with Michaela about including men in this whole debate and press because men, lots of men are fathers to daughters. And I say to them, would you like to think that when your daughter went for an interview that she was discriminated against? No, you wouldn't. So, you know, you can address you know and that but they are all the time so you know and I think um, often and I did find I had a very particularly difficult colleague at one company who was um, um, I won't go into detail about what he did or what he said but funnily enough a few years later I saw him when he had daughters who were older starting to talk about um, how important it was that they had a wealth of, of opportunities and equality etc so yeah I, I agree with Michaela on that point entirely mm. Yeah, absolutely huge point. You go, Michaela, you go. <laughs> yeah, I want to add to what Miriam was saying there with regards to the recruitment as well. If anybody is looking for help with this, there's loads of platforms out there that um, will will make your job applications gender neutral. So it will exchange words like if you say we want confident and bold, generally women won't be as attracted to that as what a man would. And so it might say, you know, we want 
community builders or whatever, but it does it for you and, and makes these gender neutral. And as well, um, just adding a sentence at the at the bottom of the, of the job saying, this position is open to all people from all walks of life. We support diversity and inclusion. And just putting that out there will make people think that, oh, like these are an inclusive company. It's the smallest of changes that actually make the biggest of differences. But there are already tools and things out there if, if people are looking to test this themselves so they can access that as well. Yeah, and just touching on what you said there, there was a statistic um, at a conference went to recently in relation to um, EDI and companies that have a robust EDI strategy and policy have threefold more people go straight to their application page. And then even more so if your options are inclusive, if your drop down menus include, you know, a number of pronouns, not just he, she, other. Because um, I know, I feel like if my pronouns were any different, I'd want my option to be there or at least not be referred to in a block of other. So whilst I know that is a little bit of a tangent, um, it does touch on the point of like adding that onto the recruitment slides. It's hugely important. Um, so you have touched on a lot of this in what you've been speaking about. Um, but I just want some experiences of being a woman within your industry, um, including some positives. Um, and any assumptions and then consequences of that bias. So I'm going to go to you, Michelle. <laughs> right. Um, negative. So I'm going to start off negative because it's better to start with negative than touch up on a positive. So people assuming that I'm not competent, dismissing my points until it's brought up by another person who's heard my point, brought it up, and then everyone's like, oh, that's such a good idea. And I'm like, oh, I just said that interrupting me and not letting me finish my sentences and it's it's really annoying um but it's gotten better since i've become a lot more competent as well um and you know when you put that cn to the back of your email title there's a reason why people do that and i know why now um a negative as well as i find it hard to relate to all the um cis white heterosexual male uh men in my workplace so it makes it harder for me to chat and then build up a working relationship and as everyone knows it's not about what you do what you do or what you know but it's about what who you know however there are some positives to that it's like people are a lot more curious about me they ask me like where i'm from what i do because obviously i don't sound very scottish i mean i have been working on my scottish accent for the past 13 years unfortunately it's not working um, there are some negative assumptions. Um, so negative assumptions I've seen and encountered is that people will think that, oh, the woman we dealt with all the labor for child rearing. And then it makes it harder for them to think, okay, maybe I'll invest in time or upskilling this person because they, they may go away. So it's helpful to actually challenge those assumptions. And as uh, Michaela was talking about, like bringing the men into the conversation and not putting all in, in you know, labeling, oh, everyone's terrible except myself. But bringing them in and having this open discussion and not blaming people so quickly. I find that there are a lot of people that are very curious and they want to know, but they're just scared and they don't know how to start off that dialogue. So it's just gearing that conversation there. So that is nice. Yeah, it's about accountability and transparency as well, isn't it? It's just it's being able to stand forward and say, this is the situation. This is what we're going to do about it. Definitely. Um, Michaela? Sorry, I thought Miriam was going. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> barriers. Uh, well, the reason that I actually started my first company, um, I'll, I'll make this brief, but I was working for another company selling advertising. It had been a startup business. They was doing six thousand pounds a month sales. When I went, I was the second sales rep to join there. I was maybe twenty two at the time. It was run by two young men. Everybody just trying to, you know, figure out the way in the world. After several years of me working there, helping to recruit, we pin, we train different sales techniques. I was basically an unofficial sales manager. Um, and they wanted an official sales manager. So at this point, they was doing £100,000 turnover a month. Pretty much everybody who there was somebody who I knew or I'd recruited. Naturally, everybody was like, Michaela's going to get this job. I was basically drinking wine at lunchtime, knowing I've got this job. And then um, I went to apply and they said, oh, you need not apply because we want an older man. I was like, what? 
<laughs> what do you mean you want an older man? I have turned your business around. And um, they was just adamant. And they, I, I wouldn't say unfortunately then, it wasn't, I fortunately fell pregnant, but I was kind of stuck at this business because I was pregnant. I was 24 years old. They took on the sales manager as promised. Nigel was his name, you can imagine. Really loved the chat, but um, they asked me to train him. They actually asked me to train him. So not only could I not get promoted, they wanted me to be stuck in this, in this role. And I think they did not realize at the time what they was doing. They definitely didn't. They just had this vision in the mind of this is what a sales manager looks like. It was so typical of that era. This is a sales manager. And they wanted to take the business in that direction literally down to the detail of how they looked so um I had my son and when he was four months old I left and started my own company because I just thought I'm, I'm stuck I'm stuck here forever so I was fortunate enough to again have the crazy mum who taught me I can go on and do anything and I was able to go on and make that successful I understand not a lot of women are and would leave industries or these the jobs or just feel stuck forever and um, so I guess that's the biggest barrier I'd face personally and how I got over that which was just throwing caution to the wind and doing my own thing um, but the positives of, um, of, I guess, being a woman in construction, there's loads of positives because I am a woman in construction as well. So we are quite rare, you know, people want to chat with you. Um, I, I'm also blessed with being ginger and northern. Again, all quite unusual when you're working on London construction sites. Um, so I, I guess it's just that intrigue, like Michelle was saying, um, and it's all, I love construction, all the banter around it and all the positivity. The way that I break down the kind of, um, what's our male counterparts would be, there are 20% of men who are real ambassadors and beyond that, who really, really support women, who sponsor our awards, who advertise with us, who give us contracts, like no problem, I will support you because this is a female-led business. Then you have this 60% in the middle who are like, yeah, you know, I, I don't mind, I'll crack on, I'll give the best person the job, which is a saying I hate. But, you know, they, they, they're kind of this middle ground who are neither in or there. And then you just have 20% who are just, you know, just don't speak to me because they're outright pigs and, you know, they're still around. Hopefully they'll all be leaving the industry soon. So I think what we need to do is focus on this 20%, make them spotlight the fact that these are allies and this is what they do. We had a male ally award last year and we really promote the work that is, is called Noah, the work that Noah does, how he supports us. And the reason that he backs us is because he's got daughters, one of which wanted to get into construction and he wanted all of the girls to, to, you know to have the same opportunities as what the men get uh, just as Miriam was saying before so there's pros and cons to it all and it, like any business owner you try and use every bit of difference to your advantage so I make the most of being a woman in construction. I think I might have to speak to uh, the equal group and just say sorry I'm moving into construction Michaela's really sold it we're, we're all going um Martin Hanley has made a really good um, suggestion um, about a book called That's What She Said by Joanne Lippmann. Um, I've not read it myself, but I have read some snippets from it. Um, and he said it is an eye-opening read, especially for men. It changed the way um, he behaves and run meetings. So it's a great suggestion um, for any tips. So Miriam? Um, well, early, quite a way back in my career, early Sean, so I was probably late 20s, I'd had a stint working in the States with the company that I was at, and I was coming back to be told, oh, your job doesn't exist anymore, but we'll give you this other one in corporate finance if you'd like to do that. Okay, great, go for it. Um, and at that time, I was going to networking events and trying to reach out and meet people and learn about um, this new world. And... Um, Every room I went into, I was probably the only woman and I was probably at least 20 years younger than the average man in the room. And so I, this isn't for me, and I left and moved on. So their loss, I would argue. Um, but um, had I had more support and um, help in anticipating that and then knowing how to deal with it, then it could have been a very different situation. And so I think what I tried to do, I, in fact, I was in Dubai last week with some of my team and one of my team, female member of the team, was going to do a speech in an engineering uh, conference. So very male dominated and also in Dubai, very, you know, 
culturally different to, to our thing and so we put a lot of prep into it she, you know she rehearsed we thought about it we supported her and I think that's the point um and that gives people more confidence to do things that perhaps are slightly out of their comfort zone and so on so anticipate that people might uh, be uh, lack confidence or be nervous about something and, and it could be the environment the culture the, the task itself etc and so that's what I've tried to do I try and help and coach and support both men and women who work for me um but I think recognizing in an individual um what their needs might be and helping them with those things and and you know often in females it's a particular type of need and often in males it's a, a different type of need but you know that they're, they're quite generalizations but I think that's for me um been a real positive for me in in my career um that I've been able to help people as I've learned maybe sometimes the hard way but I can help others um more so to not have to go through what some of what I went through so. I think that's um a basic description of being an ally isn't it you've experienced it in a certain way um and you want that to change going forward and I think that's absolutely huge um mm. to get through the barriers that are still in place mm. um and I think now what's important is you know knowing how do we drive that change and, and what can women and men as allies and organizations do better to support women um again I know you've touched on it a little there Miriam but I'm, I am going to come straight back to you anyway <laughs> Um, if you wanted to touch on that well I think culture we haven't really talked we sort of alluded to it a little bit but I think making helping particularly you know influencing the culture in your organization to make it um you know um uh, supporting of equity and equality um and we all everyone in an organization has a role to play in that I think there is the leadership is important but we everybody has a role to play so that would include calling out when you see the wrong behavior um, and addressing it without letting it continue um, and I think also actively encouraging um, you know in meetings for example um, I'm looking forward to reading Martin Hanley's recommendation but 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 one of the things I do is actively ask you know Sally you look like you've got something to say what, what, what's in your mind and you know giving um, you know you're not trying to put somebody on the spot but you're trying to give them an opening to to, to where, where you feel they might be uncomfortable um so um you know that that's a, a sort of another area i think we can help in and, and i think um every as i say everyone no matter where they are in an organization has a role to play in that mm. absolutely um michelle great <laughs> no, just taking notes um it's interesting uh I feel like uh, driving changes, definitely, it comes back to the assumptions and people checking their assumptions, checking their privileges. Like an example is, oh, um, we're going to have a Christmas outing. Who's going to organize it? Let the woman handle it. You're like, ah, can it not be a woman this time? Um, although that said, I did say social outing. So I think it will be important to be patient in including people into more social outings so that you can build up that working relationship. A lot of people, once they get older, they find it harder to make friends. And that's because they feel that, oh, I've, I've gotten so different. I like football. Uh, Michelle does this weird martial arts where they hit each other with sticks and they shout. I, I don't get that. You know, that's really weird. But that is an opportunity to realize that we have something in common, which is a competitive sport. So what is it that we like about these things? Another thing which Miriam taught, uh, brought up, which is taking initiatives. So a lot of people just are on, on the sidelines. They're like, oh, someone else will handle it. It's this diffusion of responsibility that really grinds my gears. Like, why do we have to wait for someone else to handle it? Why not just us? Why don't we just want to start up something and make sure that someone's okay? Like, I'm a trade union equality rep. And before I was a rep, a lot of people kept coming to me with their problems and, and telling me like what's going on and I would check in on them. And then it made me realize I should probably be a rep because I, this is out with my boundaries. And there was an example where someone was just being bullied and nobody dealt with it. Everyone was just like, oh, okay. They were sorted out amongst themselves. And the manager was a woman and she was like, oh, just sort it out. You know, it, you're being bullied, but you know, sort it out amongst yourself. And I was like, are you kidding? This person's being bullied. And I sent them an email, like indiscreetly, are you okay? Do you want to talk about it? Let's meet outside just to check in on them. So it's important to just take initiatives. Another thing as well is, you know, organizing, taking parts and promoting your trade unions within your industry. I know it's really, really scary because if it's something like a uh, private 
private industry, you can be, you know, acts really quickly, but it is important to have this um, structure in place. And it is really, really important. So, so please, please, please do, do take part. And that is me. Thanks, Michelle. There's some amazing points there, especially um, in regards to making sure that we're, you know, active allies. Um, it, it's great, you know, positioning ourselves to say that, you know, I would stand up for anyone in any situation and I, I'd do what I can do. Um, but actually taking that step and moving forward to helping them actively is just a huge, huge part of it. Um, before we sort of go to our closing, is there anything else that anyone wanted to add um, before I open up the Q&A? Sorry, yeah, Michaela didn't Oh, apologies, Michaela. Is this because I've already spoken enough? So. <laughs> no, blame, blame ADHD, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> there, is, there is actually a couple of things that I, I would just like to add to that, what we've been saying. Um, I love the fact that um, Miriam's saying, you know, she's a, an active ally and acting as a mentor as well. I think it's crucially important, and just as Michelle was saying earlier on, where, um, you know, some people can put them off, but I'll, I'll say, this is how I dealt with it, so now you deal with it the same way. It's really important, you know, that we're open-minded and different generations, different experiences, etc. So that's great, but what I do find is, um, and which I work with large organisations, particularly large organisations, is the, um, the top level, uh, you've got all these great initiatives, you know, we're going to get the toilets on site, so they won't use, be used as storage facilities, we're going to get more women in, we're going to do all of these really great things, and I honestly believe they mean it but then it gets to middle management and then it gets to society and it just fails and they just don't know about it so uh, a lot of these large organizations we started introducing reverse mentorship so they can really hear what this is like on site you know and the women are like I've just heard him talking about this one particular company who are fabulous by the way but she was saying oh I've just heard him talking about how the female facilities are so sorry to go on about toilets and all but how the female facilities are so good and um, she was like but it's a storage box and this site doesn't even have any I was like right we need to get you speaking for him the md of this global construction company and we introduced a reverse mentoring program and it has been fabulous it, and it is middle management who do not understand the passions properly from the top being filtered down and then ensuring that this takes place on site so i would suggest any organizations where possible even if you're a small organization reverse mentorship have the structured conversation and so that conversation is opened up to everybody um, check yourself for tokenism. You're not just ticking boxes. And so make sure as well that the um, your culture within your organization is prepared for this. So there isn't an accusation of tokenism as well. And by that, I mean, explain to people, I am recruiting a woman from finance to come into the construction industry because she's got this wealth of experience doing this. This isn't because I want a woman on the board, it's because of her additional experience in a different industry that I want to bring into this company and explain to people before they start the job why you are recruiting that person so that they're not accused of tokenism and also check your framework so if you use a big supply chain subcontracts chain or whoever then then look at what those companies look like and um, do they have no women is there huge gender pay gaps um or, you know whatever you're aiming for you what do they actually look like as an organization as well and try and weight your own tender process based on edi within that organization give it some weight in at least yeah, imagine if I'd have missed you there. The, the, the points that you've made are uh, incredible points, particularly in relation to reverse mentoring. And I think that does, as you say, touch on what Michelle said um, about sharing that experience from different levels, different perspectives. Um, so yeah, absolutely huge. And tokenism, definitely um, a great way to combat that as well um, by suggesting, you know, explaining why you feel like it's important um, for someone to be placed within that position rather than it just being, she's a woman. There we go. We fixed it because if you don't if you don't fix the values within it, the culture won't change. Um, so, do we have any questions um, for our lovely speakers? Um, also, there's a webinar poll um, that will be taking place now. If you wouldn't mind filling that in, 
Um, and also just to confirm, um, if this was a room full of men, I would also call you lovely because that is what I do to everyone. <laughs> Um, but if I mean, if we don't have any questions, let me just check through the chat because there have been so many good suggestions in relation to um, reports to look at and books to look at. Um, Maria Blakely has suggested um, looking into a powerful women cultivating female talent in energy report, um, which is in the chat. Uh, the link has been posted as well. Um, if you want to take a look at that as well. Um, but I can't see any questions or any hands up. And um, so does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Oh, Min Mindy, I can see Mindy's hands off. Hi everyone. Um, so I've got a um, 17 year old daughter who is about to go into um, the sort of construct, well it's a marine engineering industry actually, she's very excited. Um, so I would, given the wealth of experience that's here in this room, I would just like to ask, um, you know, because she is nervous, she's very, she's very aware that it's a male dominated industry and she's very aware that the, the department she's working in is, is male dominated. So I'd just like to ask everyone here, what sort of bit of advice would you give a, a 17 year old who may be feeling a little bit vulnerable due to, due to the fact that she's a she? um so oh sorry i think because of the fact that you are so supportive and you want to seek out advice with us means that your 17 year old daughter will be open to coming to you if there are any issues so you are an amazing mother for doing this and i think what happens is having that structure means that she'll be open to talking to you so what i would suggest is role playing role play how different scenarios might happen so that when you're in that when sorry you're, when your daughter is in that situation she doesn't get stuck into that freeze flight or fawn response then she'll be like ah i have remembered this as such i will say this but um do take note that it doesn't work for everything and it may um cause more issues and then that's when you can say this is when you start taking your phone out to record. Sorry, I just went into the most negative situation ever, but that's my that's my brain. Great advice, thank you. Marika, sorry, are you are you saying something? No, no, no. I I was just waiting. Sorry, I I was going to say I think um, preparing her for those scenarios is a very similar point that Michelle that that might arise, and I think also if difficult situations do arise it's not a failure um, and making sure that it's not seen in a negative way because it's quite po in any walk of life you have challenges that you have to try and overcome so I think you know and and um, so I think that that's important that if issues arise it's not her fault it's not a negative thing and and, and preparation I think definitely if um, so that she has more confidence and and I actually think she has to be herself as well just encourage her to be herself and have confidence in her own ability to um you know get through life and deal with what might be some slightly tricky situations mm. yeah i think definitely this have whole confidence maybe it's 100 percent correct have confidence in being yourself but i think focus on the positives here that like she's a young girl going into any industry it doesn't matter just take away the fact it's male dominated when you go to get your first job it's hard. My first job was like being a buzz girl cleaning tables. It was awful. I was like 13 years old on two pounds ten an hour, and everybody just thought I was utterly, I was utterly useless. And everybody made a point of that. You know, it just we we have to toughen our children up as well. And I'm sure you do this, Mindy, as well as supporting them. But you know. This is the real world now. It's not all going to go swimmingly well. Prepare for that. That doesn't matter that it's male dominated. Again, we have so many brilliant differences being women. And, you know, a lot of the time, especially when it's a young girl, again, more in construction, but on site, you will find the men more pandering to them. And, oh, can I help you with that? You know, some people find it insulting. I'll carry my own tools. But at the same time, there, there are very caring men out there as well. So there's loads of positives with, with being a woman in these male dominated industries so I would really focus on this prepare prepare her for the fact that this is the real world you know it might all go tits up but such is life prepare her for that and build up the confidence in this is your potential this is what you need to do just as you do in a parent if she was going into any industry
brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much for your support. Thanks for your question, Mindy. Um, we have got um, a couple more questions on the chat. Um, I'm just going to open this up to anyone who'd like to answer it. Um, Claire Collette said that it's a pity there aren't more men on this webinar. Um, how do we get them behind this? I think most of us know men, don't we? We have men in our lives in one shape or form or another. Friendship, parents, children, siblings, etc. And so I think you have to start with what you can do and, you know, make sure that you encourage your own network and your colleagues as well to um, be open to um, these ideas and so on, um, for sure. But actually, I just saw one other thing on the chat, which was a question about asking a question about mentors. So I'll pick that up if that's all right while, while I'm going. Um, I always felt slightly uh, nervous about having a mentor provided to me by my company, somebody internal, and I always didn't like that. I did have that at one time in my career. Um, so I didn't want to feel like, I didn't feel I could talk about my innermost real feelings in, to somebody who was in a leadership position in my organisation. So no. So I've, I actually have used my older sister as a, as a mentor throughout my life and career. Um, she was, um, you know, a, a senior HR executive and, um, you know, and, and, and I tended to, to use her. I found her a really uh, good uh, person to bounce ideas off and to give, give me advice. So. That's great. And anyone else um, with either of the questions, you know, how do we involve more men into conversations like this? Or did you have a mentor to get to where you are today? Michaela, I'll let you go first because I answered the first one uh, first. All right, thank you, Michelle. I think um, with regards to mentorship, no, I had I'd never had one. Well, I guess there was this butchery who used to sell me sausage sandwiches when I first started my businesses. And he was a really nice old man. And he, I guess he mentored me about accounts, albeit like old school. Um, but, he, but he was great. Just the only other person I knew in the world who had his own business, to be honest. I was from a, I guess, deprived background. Um, so I never had a mentor. I winged it. Now I, I'm older. I see the importance of that. And I mentor several people. Um, so I would advise anybody, and like Miriam as well, outside of the company, whether that is somebody who's a family relation or just with within your industry who's had that lived experience who can help you through. And sorry, Charlotte, what was that first question? Because I did have something to say. Um, sorry, no, the, I mean, the first question was Mindy Dalloway's question about her 70-year-old daughter. Um, that's all. That was no, the so um, about uh, how we get more men involved in conversations yeah. like this, joining the webinars. Yeah, I think sending them out this webinar actually will be really useful to see that this is not like some male bashing episode and we're not all like, kill the men, burn them at the stake, take their jobs, we want the money. Like this is the, what we're, we're about. I don't, I don't really know many women who are. Um, so I think just explaining this is an open conversation. Please be part of it. You know, this is not, a, you are not welcome. This is a, please do come along to it. So showing them the evidence of conversations that do take place and that we'd like them to be part of would be a great start. So I guess sharing this webinar once, once you're ready to do that. Um, those were some good points. Uh, I feel like some of the men that I've spoken to, a lot of them are very scared to join these kind of things because we in our in our organization we have something to promote gender equality. And when I've tried to promote it out uh, in the company, they're like, oh, I don't know, Michelle, it makes me feel like I'm maybe weak or something, or I may be a big S I S S Y. I don't want to spell it out. Um, so I think it feels like a lot of them are afraid of being seen to be weak or being vulnerable. So then as such, it's important to tell them, like, no, no, actually, you joining with all these other women and doesn't make it seem like you're uh, SISSY, you're actually being an advocate. And just because other people may think it is, doesn't that mean that you are actually more courageous and more braver because you are doing something more scary? So it's encouraging and just changing that mindset. And in terms of the mentor, I have none. I am a middle child. So even if I color my hair purple, nobody in my family will notice. So that as such, I'm very resilient. However, that said, I've had to, you know, I'm sure Mir Miriam and Michaela have noticed as well that, you know, you have to analyze the social interaction. You have to know how to play the game and appease to people and build up these connections and then use it to your advantage. And that's what I've done. That makes me sound like a psychopath. Oh, dear. No, all great points. Thank you so much. We, we have actually reached our time limit now, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for this conversation. 
Um, it's in been incredible to get all of your insight and really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, the contact details are in the chat. It's just contact at the equal group .com. Um, But thank you all for joining. We really appreciate it.